let us start lecture 23 and the course is corrosion protection methods. As you have noticed for the last few lectures, we have been talking about uh, different materials considerations for corrosion protection and in last few lectures, we talked about material selection and we talked about material selections under general corrosion and then uh, we started looking at material selection for localized corrosion. And in the localized corrosion, we have seen that the two major things which are basically pitting and crevice and there are other forms which also involve localized pattern. For example, uh, de-alloying it can happen locally uh, or intergranular corrosion where it happens along the grain boundary or you can also have uh, erosion corrosion where it is not like a microscopically localized portion rather it can have macroscopic localized regions like if you, if you have a bent uh, pipeline and if uh, slurry is moving in that pipeline and if it is corrosive then wherever that slurry hits the bent portion that portion becomes vulnerable for corrosion attack and there could be leakage. So, those are you can consider that as to be a localized, but in a macro scale I will talk about that later on. But let us consider uh, first the localized fashion in microscopic scale and that microscopic scale will grow into macroscopic form. Now, we talked about peating it starts with a very localized positions and then it grows and then forms a may forms a uh, macroscopic uh, peat so at times it can go to microscopic region, but mostly it stays with microscopic scale. Now, we talked about material selection for peating and mostly we have noticed that if we have molybdenum in your steel, then that gives you a very good pitting resistance. It actually improves the scale protection okay, or the film protection. Now, as we have seen that for example, 304 which is uh, 188 uh, austenitic stainless steel, if we have molybdenum then it converts to uh, 316 where molybdenum addition is around 2.5 to 3.5 percent, which is in weight percent and that gives you a very good corrosion protection towards peating uh, against the peating corrosion. Okay. Now, uh, if we add more molybdenum into it and then we can move to nickel based alloys like encolin or uh, past alloy where we have lot of nickel molybdenum as well as chromium content is also enhanced. So, that gives excellent pitting resistance. So, today we will talk about crevice uh, corrosion material selection for crevice corrosion as well as material selection for other macroscopic localized corrosion forms. Now, if you consider uh, the broad topic still it is materials aspect for corrosion protection and we will talk about crevice corrosion. In fact, if we look at the crevice corrosion part, it poses two challenges to us. Uh, one is of course, design challenge that means, crevice what are the challenges it proposes, it actually poses us. Uh, it, uh, this is challenges, one is design challenge and the second one is metallurgical challenge. Now, uh, if we uh, look at this design challenge, we have had uh, a good amount of discussion on this design challenge and they have uh, we have looked at uh, from the point of avoiding crevice in a component okay, like corners. If we have corners then you make it rounded crevice is avoided the crevice corrosion can be avoided to a great extent. Or if you have a small gap in the, uh, in the riveted portion, so that gap can be filled up with welding. Okay. So, that that gap would not lead to a crevice uh, corrosion sites. 
Similarly, if we have let us say a tank, where uh, those duds are depositing at the bottom and then uh, what design modification we can do, we can make that bottom part little rounded as well as moving downwards. So, that when the when the fluid flows out, it will also take those dots along with it. So, that there should not be any deposit at the bottom of the tank and those deposits if that small uh, dirt falls on the bottom part and then that can also lead to a very microscopic crevice portion. Okay. So, those are actually design modifications. Now, we will look at the metallurgical challenges. So, if we look at if we if we see that in some of the instances like flange joint, it is very difficult to avoid crevice. In most of the cases, if we can avoid crevice that is the best, then if we cannot then we should go for a better materials, which have materials which have a very good crevice corrosion protection ability. Okay. So, we will talk about metallurgical challenge. So, when we talk about metallurgical challenge, fine. So, uh, in that case, we have a better material. So, the material which shows a very good beating resistance, for example, 316 uh, stainless steel which is austenitic, but having molybdenum of the, order, of the order of around 3 weight percent that can give you a fairly good crevice resistance or crevice corrosion resistance. So, now we can talk about 316 stainless steel. Now, if we want to have a better crevice protection, we can go to 316 L stainless steel. So, 316 L means it is a low carbon here carbon content could be of the order of 0.08 percent, it is all in weight percent and when it is becoming L that means low carbon that time carbon could be order of 0.03 that is the level of carbon percentage. So, that the chromium carbide formation is avoided. So, this is one material that can be used. For example, in some of the instances uh, uh, where uh, severely corrosive is severely severe corrosive uh, fluid is handled like a pipeline which handles sea water or hot sea water which is extremely corrosive. So, there even this 316 SS cannot work. So, we have to go for a much better crevice corrosion resistant alloys. So, those alloys are basically nothing but titanium or titanium based alloys. So, now commercial pure titanium can be made of uh, can be can be used for making pipeline holding those extremely high corrosive chloride based corrosives like hot NaCl solution. So, a commercial titanium alloy commercial titanium pure titanium okay. or if we consider that a bit better corrosion resistance against crevice is required, then we can even go for titanium 0.15 weight percent palladium. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, very costly because you are using palladium. So, now in order to avoid uh, uh, that cost implication, what can be done is let us say we have a flange. Okay. So, let us say I just put it as a flange. So, the flange making can be with palladium and pipe system with commercial titanium. So, that way we can actually avoid the uh, cost implications. So, the flange portion actually contains the crevice part. So, that can give a very good crevice corrosion resistance and rest of the pipe system which is made up of a commercial pure titanium that has fairly good uh, corrosion resistance uh, when there is no crevice present. So, that way and also if we see titanium 0.15 percent palladium and titanium that junction 
if we consider the galvanic effect that galvanic effect can be also minimized to a great extent, because it is the same base metal with a little bit of palladium in one case, another case there is not much of other elements present, it is a commercially pure commercial titanium or commercial pure titanium. So, that way this is a cheaper options. Okay, cheaper option. So, this is another uh, material which can be used, even uh, people can use uh, uh, some of the materials like cupronickel can be used for uh, having uh, crevice resistance under uh, mildly corrosive conditions. Fine. So, uh, so, these are the materials which can be used for crevice corrosion to prevent uh, the material from getting attacked by strong corrosives uh, when the crevice is present in that particular structure. Now, let us look at uh, this is about uh, the crevice part, which is another localized form, which is extremely localized form. And as you know that uh, for the crevice to form, four conditions are to be satisfied. One is definitely uh, you have to have a crevice where, uh, uh, where uh, access to the solution is there, but uh, uh, there is not much of churning or it is a stagnant condition. So, the stagnancy, so that means the crevice point should be as wide to get an access for the uh, corrosive to enter and second one is that particular crevice point should be fine, it should be narrow enough to maintain stagnancy. So, these two conditions are the first two conditions and then the second condition of course, there should be a difference in, difference in uh, oxygen content, okay. there should be presence of chlorides. Okay. So, then that can have a fantastic uh, uh, cohesive uh, situation for forming crevice corrosion okay, or crevice corrosion attack sites. Now, let us look at some of the corrosion forms which are also localized in, uh, if you consider the pattern wise. For example, D alloying. D alloying is can be seen over a area, but that can be locally situated in a uh, on, on a pipeline, let us say plug type uh, D alloying portion. Fine. So, you have let us say this is my pipeline, you can have a kind of uh, D alloying at the local portion. This is D alloying portion. So, that can be looked at from a macroscopic localized attack. Okay. So, this is dealloying. So, now if we consider so that means, let us talk about material selection for dealloy. Now, uh, uh, the de alloying is observed in case of copper zinc alloy, basically brass, where zinc goes out leaving behind copper. What happens? Initially, both copper and zinc they dissolve and since copper ion has a higher, has higher reduction potential than zinc ion, because both are dissolving. Uh, in the form of ions. So, then copper ion would redeposit back by because of the reduction of copper ion and then we are left with no almost literally no zinc on the surface with enriched copper portion. So, that particular thing is called de zincification or de alloying of brass. Now, in order to avoid de zincification of brass, so we have to avoid de zincification brass. So, in order to avoid, we can go for addition of little bit of tin. Okay. So, for example, 70, 30 copper zinc brass, where 70 percent is copper and 30 percent is zinc. This is, these are all in weight percent. So, there 
we can modify it like this 70 maybe 29 percent zinc, 70 percent copper. One percent tin, so that can give you very good uh, protection against dejinkification. Now this particular variance is called Admiralty brass. So this can find its use in marine atmosphere. Okay, so then we can also have aluminium brass where uh, okay so let's actually improve the degenification in this case also we can uh, modify it and then make it a, a better material for having protection against degenification so we add little bit of arsenic small amount let's say 0 0.04 to 0 0.06 percentage arsenic if we add it can actually provide much better protection against the alloying or degenkification. Now, uh, what this arsenic does uh, uh, when we have the process started uh, for this degenkification that means copper ion and zinc ion both are dissolving in the form of ions as well as arsenic also goes out. Now, arsenic can form a film on top of the zinc uh, brass surface so that the redeposition of copper can be avoided. So, that means to complete the process of degenkification, we have to have copper plus plus as well as zinc plus plus ion formation. So, the next step is copper plus plus takes two electron and then redeposit. Okay. Now, if we break this process, this process if we can break, then of course, the subsequent dissolution of copper as well as zinc can be avoided and in that way we can avoid degenkification. So, what arsenic does? Arsenic forms a film. And make sure that this is avoided. Okay. So, that is the function of arsenic. So, in fact, we can have another material which is aluminum brass, where we have aluminum of the order of 2 percent. So, this much is the presence of aluminum and copper is of the order of uh, 76 to 79 percent. Of course, we can have little bit of arsenic 0 0.03 to 0 0.06, this is the level. Then we can have little bit of uh, uh, iron, we can have a uh, little bit of lead of the 0 0.07 and the rest is zinc. So, this is typical composition of aluminum brass and then there again uh, this arsenic is added to prevent degenkification. Fine. Now, so this is uh, some of the material selections for uh, avoiding degenkification in case of brass. Now, if we look at another localized form, which is uh, intergranular corrosion, okay. so uh, uh, we can take reference of uh, uh, 304 stainless steel and this is also localized form, but it does not form like uh, uh, it can be a combination of several pits. For example, if you have a structure like this. around that green boundary region. So, this is blue color region 
are basically vulnerable for attack, previous attack, when there would be formation of chromium carbide. Okay. Now, attack would happen through this route and there could be formation of uh, several pits along this line. So, pits are forming like that. So, those pits can be interconnected and then it can also uh, make a kind of a path for material in uh, the solution ingress or the corrosive ingress. And if we have a stress factor associated with it, let us say stress is active like this, this particular segment can have a crack formation too. Now, in order to avoid this is also localized, but you could see that this localized form is not due to crevice, it is basically due to uh, formation of chromium carbide along the grain boundary. Now, that form of intergranular corrosion, if we talk about only 304 situation, we can avoid this chromium carbide formation and by employing uh, a different processes like uh, heat treatment, proper heat treatment uh, that is coming in the processing part. Then we can also uh, make sure that we do not use uh, uh, some of the processing routes like if we try to weld, we should not use gas welding, rather we should use arc welding. So, that the time of retention at a high temperature and most important is within that sensitization temperature, which is around 450 to around 700 degree Celsius that range we must make sure that in that range the material or stainless steel should not spend much time. So, because there we have chromium carbide formation. So, if we can avoid that definitely we can avoid intergranular corrosion because chromium will be everywhere distributed homogeneously. But if we do not have that only if we look at the materials perspective we can have one is uh, carbon content should be very low. Okay. So, generally in 304 carbon content is about carbon is about 0 0.08 percent. So, if we can con, can somehow make it low carbon which is around 0 0.02 to 0 0.03 percent, then uh, the for the chromium carbide formation, we do not have sufficient carbon. Okay. So, then definitely we can avoid uh, chromium carbide formation along the grain boundary and we can avoid intergranular corrosion. This is one and the second part, if we have some sort of elements like titanium or niobium, they have higher affinity towards carbon, so that they will form carbides. Hence, for the chromium carbide formation, the carbon availability will be very less and then chromium carbide will not form. And interestingly, these elements titanium and niobium, they have a much higher affinity towards carbon, much higher than the chromium. So, that means, whenever there is a possibility of carbide formation, they will tackle those, they will go and then form carbide. So, now when we add this titanium and niobium that carbide formers, strong carbide formers, we actually give a name to that steel, we name it as stabilized stainless steel. The stabilized stainless steel comes from the addition of those uh, higher carbon affinity uh, elements like titanium and niobium. Right? Now, when we have low carbon, we generally put a signal, we put a sign called L. So, for example, 304 L means the carbon content is low with of the order of 0 0.02 to 0 0.03 or we can have mentioned like this 316 L, where 304 and 316, the middle difference is we have added molybdenum into 304 and to convert it to 316. And if we reduce carbon from 0 0.08 to 0 0.02, 
we make it as 316L, that is the nomenclature we use. Fine. So, that way we can actually avoid intergranular corrosion and intergranular corrosion the main philosophy is somehow the potential difference between the grain boundary and grain body should be minimized. Okay. If we have excessive potential difference between the grain boundary and grain body because of something, because of de-alloying at the along the grain boundary or because of precipitation along the grain boundary that could lead to a potential difference and that would lead to a serious implication and it can form intergranular corrosion, because the corrosion attack site will be along the grain boundary. The, the region for example, let us say here we are having chromium carbide. So, that means the chromium carbide is positive or noble in nature compared to the grain body where just surrounding that where chromium is less, okay, it can go below 2 percent. So, that means that small narrow region is basically acting as negative terminal or the anode and that chromium carbide in which portion is acting as cathode or positive terminal. So, there will be a galvanic current and there could be a strong dissolution along those chromium depleted zone. Right? So, this is because of that there could be a possibility of formation of anodic precipitates which can dissolve okay? and that way along the grain boundary exactly along the grain boundary dissolution can happen because those anodic precipitates can dissolve out. So, in copper based alloy system we can experience such kind of situations. So, this is about intergranular corrosion where we have to avoid potential difference because of some phase transformation or microstructural change along the grain boundary, then we can avoid intergranular corrosion. Now, coming to another form of uh, localized attack which is erosion corrosion. Okay. So, erosion corrosion this is also uh, I can say is a macro scale localized attack. So, this also you can say uh, sub macro scale corrosion attack, sub macro scale localized attack, because there is a band along that band it happens and whereas, in case of uh, in case of dejinkification, we can make it as a again localized form or macro scale localized form. Okay. Now, if we talk about erosion corrosion, why you are putting this macro scale? For example, if you have a bend like this, fine, and some slurry is moving at a high speed, when it hits this particular portion, so that means this portion is liable for uh, excessive wear as well as corrosion and there could be a, a leakage. And this leakage is happening uh, in that particular entire pipe system leakage is happening at the point of the bend where the fluid is hitting. So, that is what it is in the macro range, but it is also localized. So, this case we have to be a bit careful in selection of material, because it is not only corrosion resistant it has to be wear resistant too, because both effects wear as well as corrosion both are combined together. So, that means erosion is basically corrosion, erosion corrosion if we look at corrosion plus wear. So, there are two extremes when there is stagnancy then it will be electrochemical, so which is falling under corrosion field, extreme field or if there is a rapid movement of particles and there is a there is a wear effect. For example, when uh, in the in the wind, when if some there is a, a wind uh, flow and that wind flow is actually eroding the surface, that will consider as a wear, because for corrosion to take place you need time, wear can happen quickly. Okay. But in case of erosion corrosion, corrosion and wear both are going hand to hand. Now, that case as we have mentioned that it should the material should have a 
possesses one is corrosion resistance as well as wear resistance. Okay. So, that is what hard surface operates better in case of uh, erosion corrosion. Okay. So, generally hard corrosion, hard surfaces generally hard surfaces can give you a very good erosion corrosion resistance, but I have put generally we can have situations where even the surface is hard, we can have a rapid rate of erosion corrosion. Okay. So, we will have some example for that. Now, when we talk about corrosion resistance, so there could be two situations. Situation one, where material is inherently So, that case uh, if we compare let us say nickel 80 percent and chromium 20 percent in this case and if we compare another one which is iron 80 percent and chromium 20 percent. So, if we compare these two alloys nickel chromium alloy has inherently higher corrosion resistance. So, then it can have higher so this material can provide higher corrosion erosion corrosion resistance. Now, coming to situation 2. So, where the corrosion resistance comes from formation of fill. or protective fill. So, their situation becomes bit tricky in the sense that uh, depending on the concentration, depending on velocity, depending on whether it is a clean solution or emulsion situation can differ. Okay. So, for example, if we talk about uh, H2SO4 storage, okay, we generally use lead we can use lead tank or lead container or let us say lead pipe which flow where through which sulfuric acid is flowed. Now, this particular situation it forms lead surface layer and that lead sulphate layer gives you very good erosion corrosion protection okay. provided this particular material is of low concentration. Okay. So, that time this gives you excellent erosion corrosion resistance. Okay. Now, if this concentration of weight is changed and it is made higher concentration. So, higher concentrated highly higher concentrated H2SO4 solution it can dissolve lead sulphate. So, once lead sulphate is dissolved the erosion corrosion resistance becomes extremely poor. So, the poor erosion corrosion resistance. So, this is a concentration effect. Now, there could be a possibility of little addition of some element which can actually have effect on the film strength and that way it can protect the material from erosion corrosion. For example, if we add elements added 
for better film strength. Okay. So, like iron, little bit of iron in cupronickel. or molybdenum addition in P 0 4 stainless steel. So, that becomes P 1 6. So, that can this two element can improve erosion corrosion resistance. Okay. So, it can improve it. Now, that is basically falling under having a better film strength. Now, when we talk about these additions like molybdenum, that actually makes it very costly. For example, 316 or 304, these are costly materials. So, one of the cheaper materials uh, which can be used for making for uh, erosion corrosion uh, point of view. So, that is high silicon steel. let us say silicon content is of the order of 14 percent. So, this is very cheap material for erosion corrosion point of view. Application. Okay. Now, coming to this part as we have indicated that material should possess uh, two properties. One is corrosion resistance, which can come due to its inherent high corrosion resistance or it can form some film, which has a very high corrosion resistance. Now, the wear resistance if we consider that the generally it should be very hard surface, like if we consider cavitation resistance, the surface harder the surface as well as smoother the surface, it should provide a good uh, uh, cavitation resistance. Okay. But there could be a situation that if the material has multi-phase structures instead of single phase multi-phase structures, but still that particular material has a higher uh, as higher hardness compared to another material which is single phase of a lower hardness. In those two cases, since first material has multi-phase, there could be a difference in potential or the galvanic effect can be felt. So, it can dissolve quickly, because it has a lower corrosion resistance, though higher hardness. So, that case erosion corrosion resistance can be compromised to a great extent. So, one such example is, so example for hardness, but poor erosion corrosion resistance. Okay. So, like if we consider 329 stainless steel as well as 316 stainless steel. If we see the composition carbon about 0 0.05 percent, these are all in weight percent, chromium 25 to 28 percent, nickel is 4.5 to 6.5 percent and manganese molybdenum of the order of uh, 1.32 2 percent. Okay. So, this is uh, the structure is basically duplex stainless steel and structure contains austenite plus ferrite. Okay. So, this is ferritic austenitic stainless steel, whereas here carbon is of the order of 0 0.06 percent, chromium is of the order of 17 to 19 percent, nickel is of the order of uh, 9 to 10 percent and molybdenum of the order of 2.5 percent. Okay. So, now if we compare, so this is single phase austenitic. Okay. So, now because and this is of a higher hardness and this was having 
lower hardness. Fine. Now, since it has two phase structure austenite and ferrite, that can lead to a higher degree of corrosion because of the galvanic effect. Whereas, austenite if we consider the single phase austenite in case of q 1 6. So, the galvanic effect due to microstructural phase content is not coming up. Okay. Now, if we consider the stagnant situation in case of if we consider the stagnant situation, stagnant situation both gives you fantastic corrosion protection when we handle sulfuric acid slurry. Okay. If we handle sulfuric acid slurry, stagnant condition both are comparable, they give very good protection, but once both satisfy. Okay. But once erosion factor comes up, 316 is much better. much better material. In fact, in some cases people have noticed that duplex stainless steel of that much of chromium around 25 to 28 percent as well as molybdenum, it has a 10 times lower erosion corrosion resistance than 316 in sulfuric acid slurry. So, this is one classic example that uh, even if it is higher hardness, it might give you a very poor uh, erosion corrosion resistance. So, we have to be careful. So, that is what it is very important that when we do uh, uh, select some material, there should be a proper laboratory testing as well as pilot testing before we induct that material for a particular use. Now, finally, uh, people have people use non metals. See if we talk about use of non metal. Okay, so, like uh, people can use uh, glassy coated steel structure or chemical reactive, chemically reactive uh, situations, okay, chemical reactor. So, one is glass coated steel container. So, this is basically in chemical plant. can be used because this glass can give you extremely high corrosion resistance, but remember in these cases one has to be very careful there should not be much of heat on the surface of the uh, uh, surface of that particular on the coating material. If there is a heat and then if that heating can lead to heat means with some object if somebody hits that particular uh, glass coated steel that glass can uh, detach from the surface and then it that can be a serious serious corrosion on the uh, substrate material which is steel. So, it can also withstand chemical effect plus temperature, both it can withstand, but here avoid impact. So, that uh, that glassy coated Glass, glass coating should not get dislodged from the surface. There could be uh, uh, refractory materials. Okay. For example, one such example is uh, acid proof brick. Lined steel for high temperature application. or one can use a rubber line steel for water treatment ion exchanger resin bed. Okay. So, there one can use rubber line steel. Now, uh, uh, if we 
see that we have briefly covered some of the material selections under general corrosion as well as localized corrosion. In the localized corrosion, we have taken two instances. One is uh, extremely microscopic defects like crevice or pitting. Even we can, we have also looked at some of the macroscopic or sub macroscopic localized attack like uh, erosion corrosion or de-alloying or even intergranular attack. So, those cases uh, we have seen and uh, tried to understand what kind of material uh, can be chosen for those applications. So, now we end our discussion on materials aspect for corrosion protection. Uh, for the last class, ne from the next class onwards, we will talk about uh, the environmental aspects like uh, uh, how can we change the environment or the corrosive condition so that we can have better protection. So, till then, thank you.